Well, for those who don't know, I'm pretty sure everybody knows I'm David Murray. I'm called the 8-Bit Guy. I actually have another channel, too, called 8-Bit Keys, where I show old Casio keyboards and stuff like that. I don't have as many viewers on there, but um, I have never done anything like this. Uh, it's quite a bit different from talking to a camera, so you have to forgive me if I go scatterbrained or lose track of what I was going to be talking about. I also thought I'd be standing up. I feel a little claustrophobic sitting here at a table. <laughs> but uh, Anyway, what I was going to be talking about, um, well, I, actually, they told me to talk for 45 minutes and then take questions. So uh, primarily, I wanted to talk about the demo scene, which is, for those who don't know, is an example of a Commodore 64 demo that I have playing here. Because they asked me to talk about graphics and sound. Uh, for vintage computers and game consoles and stuff like that because apparently those are some of my more popular episodes. So I wanted to talk about something that I've not talked about in, um, in any of my videos before. So I kind of come up with some new material, although I may turn this into an episode at some point. So um, before I get started on that, um, I guess I'll give you all a little bit of background on how I got to where I am. Uh, believe it or not, actually I had, if you had asked me two or three years ago if I was going to be making popular videos on YouTube, I would have thought you were crazy. And I never intended for it to even happen. Uh, what, what was going on was I was actually running a little side business on the weekends where I would repair and resell Apple um, laptops, particularly ones exactly like this. Yes, this is a vintage Apple iBook G4 I'm using here. I, I thought maybe I could win the contest of having uh, the most antiquated laptop for a demonstration today. <laughs> I actually tried to get one of my uh, old colored clamshells to work, but it just couldn't run uh, like this video clip. It was just too slow to handle it, so I had to go to something a little bit newer. But yeah, this is from 2005, so it's, I guess, at least 11, maybe 12 years old. <clears throat> um, Anyway, so uh, I, I had this business going where I was just buying these things broken and, and fixing them up, you know, salvage parts from one to the other, make some work, and then I'd resell them, usually on eBay. And I had this idea, you know, eBay, is, they, they're really greedy with uh, when you sell something. So if I sold a, back then these used to fetch like 400 bucks. Today they're almost worthless, but back then they, they you know, five, six years ago when I was doing this heavily, they'd fetch 400 bucks and eBay would take like 40 of that you know, so any profit margin you had was dug into pretty well with that. So I had this idea, why don't I set up a website and I'll sell these directly if I could just draw some traffic to the website. So I thought, well, I'll make a few little videos, little how-to videos on these laptops. And maybe that'll draw some traffic to my website so that people will buy these things from me and I don't have to pay the ridiculous eBay fees. So I made like, I don't know, five or six little uh, videos and they actually became surprisingly popular. Never helped my business one little bit. I don't think I ever got a single customer from that. But um, people still loved the videos, and they were always asking me, make more, make more, make more. And then one day somebody told me, says, David, why don't you monetize those videos? And I'm like, what, what's that? What does that mean? And so they explained that to me, and so it really just basically just got to sign up to have them deposit money in your bank account, click a few check boxes, so I did it. And you know, before long, I was making like 100 bucks a month just from people watching those videos. And, and I was only making like three or 400 bucks a month on the side selling these computers. So it kind of occurred to me one day, it's like, you know, it's a lot of work repairing and reselling these computers, especially dealing with all the people that were always calling me up saying, well, this didn't work and that didn't work and I can't get Word to work or Excel doesn't work or my website won't open or whatever. And so, <laughs> I just decided, you know, maybe I should focus my efforts on, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, my wife's trying to give me pointers. Here. Uh, I have not had any public speaking uh, classes, so sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, um, where was I? So, uh, oh yeah, so I decided that I would just uh, focus my attention on YouTube and, and just stop selling old computers and that's that's you know and of course I eventually ran out of ideas to talk about about old computers and for those who've been watching my channel for a long time you know I used to go by the iBook guy that was my name for a long time even long after I quit making videos about iBooks because people always ask me David why don't you make more iBook videos and I usually reply to them and I say well I think I've covered just about everything in the world I can cover about 
this computer, there's really just not left a lot left to really talk about. So I just tried to start thinking of new things. And so I really like old retro computers, so I kind of just started... Changing it into 8-Bit Guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I changed my name. It's actually my brother's idea before. to change it to the 8-Bit Guy because it sounded really similar to the iBook Guy. So it, same number of cylind uh, syllables and everything. So that that's kind of what I did. And then uh, the, the channel just... You know, I think I had some people say, well, I'm unsubscribing, and... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I had a bunch of hate mail over changing my name. <laughs> so, but considering the subscribers were still going up pretty rapidly, I figured I could do without them, so... And, and it seems to have worked out pretty well. So, you'd be surprised how much hate mail uh, I receive. I thought it was just me, but I've talked to some other YouTube personalities, and, and they're like, oh, no, it's extremely common. I mean, you get, you get a lot of hate mail. <laughs> so, um, anyway, that's kind of how I ended up where I'm at, and uh, my channel has grown well beyond what I would have ever even imagined people. I didn't even think there would be, uh, let's put it this way, I have, last I checked, around 350,000 subscribers. I didn't even think there were 350,000 people in the world that were even interested in vintage computers. So, like I said, I'm, I'm thoroughly amazed that it's that it's grown to where it is. And when they asked me to come here and speak, I I, I couldn't even believe it. I, I didn't really think I was important enough to come to a place like this and speak. So so um, so anyway, that's that's how I got to where I am. Um, so the next thing I was going to talk about. So, excuse me. I told you I probably just grabbed mine. I had a little notepad here to keep me on track. <laughs> oh, you've been around for a while. Oh, okay. So, um, I wanted, to, since I'm, I, I'm going to be talking about uh, the the demo scene here, and I'm going to kind of build my way up to that. So, the, um, I guess the first thing I want to talk about is is getting my first computer. Um, I was actually six years old in a time when almost nobody had computers. This would have been 1981. It was a Commodore VIC-20. And uh, my parents didn't know anything about it, so it was pretty much up to me and my brother to figure out how it worked, read the manual. We didn't even have any games, so the only thing we could really do was read the manual and try to write little programs. There were some type-in programs in the back of the manual, and then we would buy the magazines in the store, because back then you actually like bought magazines and typed the programs in out of them, and it took like hours to type them in. <laughs> um, but one of the things that that taught me was it taught me how the computer worked. Uh, it taught me the limitations of the graphics chips, uh, the sound chips, um, the memory. Um, and so as time went on, I began to consider those almost like you might call like the laws of physics. I mean, this is the limit of what the computer can do. There's, you know, I upgraded to a Commodore 64 like a couple of years later, and so I knew okay, the machine's got eight sprites, they can have this many pixels, this many colors, uh, it's got three voices on the sound chip, they can do these waveforms, and that's it. And, and that's kind of how I grew up. For years, as I wrote programs for them, I assumed, well, this is the, the limitations of, of what you can do, and, and there's just simply no way around it. And so I'm going to open up my little handy-dandy Commodore emulator here. Now, I actually wanted to bring a real Commodore 64 with me, but... Um, I wasn't sure if the projector would be able to hook up to that, nor I wasn't sure how the TSA would feel about me cramming all that in my carry-on bag. <laughs> so <laughs> I, um, I just brought this. So I'm going to show you something. So I just changed the border color of the screen. Now this may be old hat to some of you, and some of you may not know what the heck I'm, I'm doing here. but. What I wanted to demonstrate, and I, and I tried to think of the absolute simplest way I could demonstrate this to you, is um, there's one memory location in the Commodore that controls the color of the border of the screen. And this is just one of those, um, <coughs> one of those laws of physics like I was talking about that, as far as I knew, could not be broken. The color could be one solid color, and there's only one place to define that color. And there's 15, or actually 16 possible colors. You can do a number between 0 and 15. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I'm going to do a little program. My mouse over. Yeah. 
Oh, I forgot to map the drive. I should have done that earlier. Good job. Thank you. Wow. That was nice. <laughs> Those hardcore fans are the worst critics. Oh. <laughs> <You> forget <laughs> All right, so let's try that. Okay. So this is a, actually I wrote this little program because I couldn't find the original one that uh, I, I typed in out of a magazine. But so as you can see, this little program uh, makes the border more than one color. There's bars. <laughs> now, when I first saw this, I was probably like 10 years old. And I remember running into the, um, uh, wherever my mom and dad was like, Mom, Dad, quick, you've got to come look at this. And I took him into the back room and I showed them this and they're like, What's the big deal? Who cares? You know? And I'm like, but to me, this was like somebody telling me they've just invented warp drive or something. I mean, it breaks the laws of what I thought was possible. It broke the laws of what I thought was possible. <laughs> so, um, you know, when you show this to a person who doesn't understand the limitations of the computer, they're just like, oh, whatever. And, uh, but anyway, to me, this was a big deal. And so, um, show you there for the moment. So when you watch these, these demos, so I've, I've, I've tried showing these demos to people and uh, I'm not playing these in the emulator because um, I don't have any way to fast forward or rewind. <laughs> um, so I'm just playing some little video clips of the, the demos. But So one of the things about these, these demos, um, I'm just kind of skipping around here, but is they do things that if you were to have shown these to people in 1982, when the Commodore 64 first came out, they would have said, well, that's not even possible. How is that, how is that, how are they doing that? Because they're, they're manipulating a lot of, a lot of tricks in the computer that the original designers really either never intended or fully intended uh, to be able to do some of the stuff that they do. So I'll briefly explain, uh, actually I meant to explain that while I still had it up on the screen, uh, how the border trick was done. Um, some of you may already know, but the, uh, so back in the old days, the, the CRTs, you know, they drew the pixels from top to bottom 60 times a second or 30 times a second, depending on how you look at it. Um, so the computer, of course, or to our eyes, that happens really fast to the point that it looks like a solid image, but the computer actually knows as it's drawing the screen out exactly where the raster bar is during the, during the screen draw. So all you have to do is write a program Actually, that's something I meant to show in the emulator. Let me pull that back up. So this is, actually should have been my first clue because I remember making a program similar to this um, when I was really young. What I'm doing is I'm going to write a little program that loops the color from 0 to 15 on the border as fast as possible. Now, <laughs> it's a pretty simple thing to do, and I think probably you know every owner of one of these computers back in that time probably wrote something similar. I love making these. <laughs> and anyway, but you know, one of the things that I did actually notice when I was um, when I was when I did this when I was a kid is that you actually can see more than one color in the border. But it's not stable, of course. And so the other program that I showed you that actually locks them in, all it's doing is it's really doing the same thing. It's changing the border really quickly, but it's timing it exactly perfectly so that every time the screen comes to a certain spot, changes the color, and then when it gets down to the next spot, changes the color, and so on. And it repeats that precisely timed so that it appears solid. And um, many of the tricks that they do in these demos rely on very similar types of ideas, whether it be changing uh, sprites. So, for example, we were told there's eight sprites, but really you can have a lot more than eight. Uh, you can have eight at the top, and then you can reorient them by the time the skin comes down to the middle, and you can have eight more. And you could have, I've seen demos with hundreds of sprites on the screen at the same time if it's, if it's done correctly. So, um, I, guess, I guess the point that I was uh, trying to get to with uh, these demos, and, and I don't know how much technical detail to really go into. Um, you know, like these moving cubes here, for example, they, um, this is really something beyond what a one megahertz processor should be able to calculate in real time. 
Uh, today, with the graphics cards, we have people would look at that and, and go, that's, that's nothing. But there is no GPU in this computer. It, it has to calculate that all in real time. And uh, they use a lot of what, what they call speed code to accomplish that. And um, it's, gosh, that would, that would take some explaining. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, they use some very unorthodox means of, of calculating. Uh, some of it's pre-calculated ahead of time. But they have some really interesting means of, of calculating that stuff in real time. Because a lot of people will accuse these demos of just being video clips. But they're not video clips. You only have 64K of RAM in the computer. There's no space for a video clip. It has to be calculated in real time. So um, these demos are, you know, you show them to the average person and they're, you know, they, they don't really see the appeal because you, you have to kind of, in order to appreciate them, you have to kind of know the limitations of the machine and then, you know, I don't know if people are impressed. I don't think anybody's impressed with the machine hardware anymore, but what you're impressed with is the programmer. You're impressed with the skill of what the programmer, or in many cases, team of programmers has managed to accomplish. By the way, there was supposed to be music with this. They had the soundboard on at one point, but I think they, they turned it off. But <coughs> so you're messing with that. Yeah, it doesn't need to be that loud. <laughs> but even the uh, even the sound chips, they do some really impressive stuff to get sound and music out of these chips. That again, the original uh, designers of the chips would, you know, if you'd have gone in time machine and, and showed this to them back in 1981 or 82 when they were designing these chips, they probably wouldn't even have believed it was the chip they were designing that that's producing the sounds that you're hearing. <laughs> It, uh, they use a lot of CPU help. In other words, they're going in there and changing the parameters of the sound chip um, hundreds of times per second in order to create waveforms and um, and things that the, the chip was never really designed to do. So they, the, the demo really uh, takes advantage of the computer in both the sound and the graphics in, in, in ways that... Um, I think I'm repeating myself now, in ways it was never intended. So I think that, that more or less wraps up what I was going to say about uh, the demo scene. And there's hundreds of these things out there, and I've not, I've not even watched them all. Um, but when I watch them, I'm, I'm usually pretty impressed with them. And um, But uh, I think I'm done talking, so I guess I'll start taking questions. <laughs> yes, sir. I have a question. You were talking about the uh, performance and how the chips, you know, when, when this... Well, first of all, would this, um, you feel, take the chip into capacity and maybe even like wear out the chip? Uh, but since we have emulators, how does that play in? Is the emulators, are they able to withstand more of this graphics intensity? Could they have done it on the chip back in the day? Or, you know what I mean? You know where I'm going with that question is like the performance of the chip? If you could repeat the question. Yeah, I'm still trying to comprehend the question. So uh, the question is more or less of the limitations of the hardware and the chip. Doing stuff like this graphically, like there's so much happening graphically, uh, and the program is kind of put a lot of intensity on the on the processor to process all this. Correct. Okay, I think I understand what he's asking. He's asking if the demos, uh, I guess, you know, tax the uh, the 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 graphics chips and the sound chips, and maybe uh, is not good for them. Is well, that or would kind they, of? Would they in the back of the day would they have been able to withstand that? Or yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, yeah, all these demos are usually designed to run on the real thing. In fact, a lot of these demos won't even run in an emulator. And uh, oh, really? the, some of the emulators are not good enough to actually, you know, they're like 99% good. They're good for all the original games and stuff. But some of these demos, they, they, they use features of the chips that uh, most of the software don't use. And, and some of the emulators just can't display it properly. As far as it being bad on the chips, I'm not sure if that's what you were asking or not. But, I mean... Um, uh, not really, I mean, just to go back to my border color example, I mean, every, you know, every pixel the, that it draws down, the, the chip is simply going to memory location to check what color am I supposed to draw this border. If the number changes, it doesn't really add any extra work for the video chip. It's just like, oh, it's a different number now, whatever, and it just keeps going. So I don't think it's really, like, hard on the, I've had other people ask that before, if it's hard on the computer. And, you know, because today with the GPUs and stuff we have, I mean, you can run some stuff and it'll make it get really hot. But that's because the, the GPUs today are, are designed 
it's like they've got a peak amount of processing power they can do and they try to keep you down below that um, and they'll even throttle down if they you know have extra work but the way these are designed it's yeah and I like that so yeah I'll get to you thanks how's the wave what's it doing that wave um you know I'll be honest I don't know <laughs> <laughs> there's three or four different ways they might be accomplishing that I mean, I can tell you this, um, the CPU can't do all that. I mean, they can't redraw the screen that quickly, so they're probably using some kind of raster trick with, uh, uh, there, are, there are registers in the graphics chip that allow you to move um, the screen left and right. They're probably doing something where they're modifying that each scan line to move it a little bit, or something like that. I, there could be other ways of doing it too, I'm, I'm not, not really sure. <laughs> so what was your question? So my experience with demos, and I don't know if everybody can hear me, is mostly through pirated software. <laughs> like I would see, like you would load a game on, on your Commodore, <coughs> and before the game, it would be like the, the group that cracked the game. Oh, yes. The game. Yeah. yeah, so what he's talking about, um, so back in the day when you would download pirated software, uh, you would have uh, often these little intro screens to let you know who cracked the copy protection on the software. And uh, those actually became more and more elaborate over time. I think in the early days it was just a little one screen with a few text lines and then they got a little bit more elaborate and they wanted to show off their skills so they would they would add a little bit more and a little bit more and we called them intro or crack screens. And yeah, they, they I think they did evolve into what the modern demo scene. I mean, is that kind of where the demo scene I think came, so. came from? I or? think it is. I think that's kind of what it, where it evolved from. So where are these? Because like, is there, a, like, where would you get these? Would you download these on a BBS? Or like, I guess, where did you get these ones? Oh, well, these are modern. I mean, this one was made just uh, last year, I think. Oh, wow. So there's still a very active demo scene, people making this stuff today to compete. In fact, they've got some place over in, like, Finland, I think, where they, they have, like, a yearly competition where they bring people together and you, you show off what you've made and then they give a prize to the person with the most advanced and impressive demo. Uh, Actually, there was something else I was going to show you all, I just remember. I was going to show you the first demo I ever saw. Something old. Yeah, this is really old. This came out in 1982 or 83. Getting keys, my friend. So this was the Caliber 64 Christmas demo, and I don't entirely know the history behind this, but I know that they used to play this on Caliber 64s like in computer stores and stuff where they were selling the computer. So the purpose behind this demo presumably was to show off the computer's capabilities and sell computers, I, I, I would assume. But once you see a little bit more of it, I'm going to tell you something shocking about this. I have to wait for it to... I can't fast forward this because this is actually playing the emulator. And there is some music in this too. I don't know if it plays yet or not. It's just Christmas music. Yeah, there should be some kind of very primitive music playing. Uh, yeah, it's not very impressive. This is, this is kind of what early Sid music sounded like on the Commodore 64. I think. Just before they really knew how to take advantage of the Sure. Now, the thing that may surprise you about this graphics is they aren't really graphics at all. This is actually text mode. <laughs> well, it's actually what we call Petsky. Uh, the C64 had these little special characters on the keyboard that on, on the bottoms of the keys that would you could push a different uh, like shift key and stuff and, and get these little characters. And. Uh, and uh, there's some several other screens here with some little demos, but yeah, they didn't even bother to use um, bitmap graphics. Although the candle, uh, the the uh, the flame is actually a sprite, so it's technically graphics, although it's not bitmap graphics. It's it's just a sprite they've they designed. But everything else on the screen is just characters. And so one of the things I was going to show you about that, I guess I'll I'll t take a moment to uh, I keep forgetting it. Got a mouse. They brought me a mouse. <laughs> Got to. Um... I 
I've actually written several um, C64 programs over the years, and this is one I wrote a couple of years ago. Oops. I keep mistyping because this emulator I'm using on here is not the one I'm used to, and they've got the keys, um, the emulated keys in a different arrangement than, than what I'm, I'm used to. This is actually a little program I, I made myself uh, just a couple of years ago, and it's actually a uh, program for uh, drawing stuff with Petsky graphics. Only one of the problems is with using a modern computer with an emulator is you don't have the little pictures on the keys anymore, and so it's hard to draw. Uh, graphical or Petsky graphics without having a real Commodore keyboard. So I made this little program where you can actually pick the characters you want and plot them on the screen. And um, one of the things that you can do is, um, which I thought was pretty cool, is there's um, what they call these little block characters, and you can't see them here uh, very well, but they've got these different characters that essentially when combined together allow you to I don't know exactly how to explain it. Create uh, balls. Well, uh, if you were to just use uh, one big block for each character, you'd have a, a 40 by 25 screen. And using these little block characters, you could double that to an 80 by uh, 50 screen. And I actually uh, um, added a little mode here. Um, so that you can plot those and it'll actually automatically figure out what character to use and then if you go back to regular mode you can actually see exactly which characters it has used to, to create that but it makes it easier to draw stuff out of that and I'll show you an example of something that I drew yeah I'm a big Futurama fan so, uh oh I didn't find my uh, well let's see Okay, these are the ones I actually ripped from the Commodore Christmas demo that I just showed you. So you can actually see exactly what characters they've used here. Um, I actually drew a picture of Dr. Zoidberg. If I could uh, figure out what it was called. Oh, apparently I forgot to copy it over there. We have a rat. I guess you won't see that. I did copy another really impressive one over there, though. I will show you this. This was actually done by somebody else. I did not draw this, but I managed to import it into my program. Um, this is actually a... Uh, somebody else did this as part of an art competition on the C64, and believe it or not, this is all character graphics. There is no bitmap graphics here. Uh, it's really impressive work, uh, and it's kind of neat to take my program and to go through and look and see exactly every character they used. To, to create this, but it's it's really impressive work what you can do with uh, text-based graphics. And um, something you may not be aware of is back in the uh, pre-internet days, we used to call these things called BBSs. I heard a few people mention that already. And on the Commodore, um, you could use these text-based graphics. A lot of the other systems, like the Apple IIs and stuff, they had BBSs too, but they were just pure ASCII, you know, just letters and numbers. But one of the neat things about Commodores during the time was that the BBSs could transmit these text characters over and so people would draw these really impressive little, uh, uh, it, like when you would log into a BBS system it would give you, you know, like they'd have their own little logo for the BBS and they had these artists that would draw stuff like this to really, I wish I had some more examples I could show you, but um, so I, I still kind of have a fondness for text-based graphics simply because of the challenge and the respect I have for someone who can work with so little. I, I, I tend to I like to compare it, you see these art projects sometimes where somebody made some fantastic thing out of Legos or they made some fantastic thing from, you know, some item you would never expect to be used for art and you give that person a lot more respect than you give someone who made the same art with a 3D printer or a CNC machine or something like that because you expect more out of the CNC machine or the, the 3D printer because it's so versatile and when, when somebody creates something out of something that's difficult, you give them more respect and I guess that's what uh, the demos and stuff like this is about is is being able to really um, respect what the artist had to go through <laughs> to design something like this. So, yeah, I'd originally planned to talk about that earlier and got off track. So I think I have actually finished talking about all the material I'd planned to talk about. So I'll go back to questions again. Yes, sir. Um, so uh, I've seen your videos on how graphics work. Like, like, so how like maybe you can do like video on how uh, graphics for like, PlayStation or Nintendo 64 works. 
So he was asking if I could do a video on how graphics on a PlayStation or Nintendo 64 work. Um, to be honest, no, I probably can't. <laughs> uh, because that really, there's a certain era, if you look at the history of computers, where everything was done with bitmap graphics, and then there was kind of a transition period where everything changed to be 3D polygons. And that's where the PlayStation and even the, uh, uh, I forget what other machine it was you're asking, but they all they work on such a very different system and, and i admit i don't know much about those so um, I'm, I'm good with bitmap graphics <laughs> yes sir are you all self-taught like you know a lot about that bit, bitmap graphics how so i do work in the it field and so yeah i know a lot about it stuff because it's my job, but when it comes to stuff like this, yeah, I'm totally self-taught. Just I'm because I've been fascinated by it ever since I was six years old. So, and it, you know, I didn't really start learning the interest keys of it until, really, to be honest, I didn't really start learning the the details of how a lot of this stuff started working until the '90s, because uh, that was when the internet became available and I could finally communicate with other people that knew how it worked. Because during the '80s, there was just no material available to people like me to learn stuff like that. Sir. Oh, great. <laughs> so, how did you, like, learn how, like, the sound worked? Um, well, mostly from the user manual of the computer. <laughs> that's, that's actually something that they don't do anymore. I mean, in the 80s, when you got a computer, it usually came with a big fat book that actually told you how everything in there worked, including a schematic diagram. They don't give you any of that today. They just tell you a bunch of legal disclaimers and stuff like that. That's all you get with your computer. Uh, yes, sir. I had a question about some of the programs, like in the video. Those are multiple different programs that like really strung together and made a video of. Uh, like the demo that I was playing earlier, that's yeah. actually just a single demo. Uh, it's just they've created several different sections and it just plays one for a second, goes on to the next. But if you were playing that off the floppy disk on the real C64, it would go through all of those it's different sections. fits on a floppy, all of that in the mm -hmm. video. Wow. Yeah. What are the, what are the like, challenges in writing code that fits on a floppy disk? Kind of curious. <laughs> well, uh, those demos, uh, what they do is uh, they, they kind of show you one piece and then they... There's often a pause, which I skip through a lot of that so you don't see, and that's because they're loading a little bit more from disk because they can't fit the whole thing in memory. Uh, but, I mean, even the floppy disks back then only held like 180K, I think, something like that. So just a little bit more than what the actual memory of the computer was. So, yeah, it's pretty challenging. Um, so who else had a question? Yes, sir. Because all parts fail eventually, and the MTBF on some of these old things were not, you know, terribly stellar, how long do you think we've got until there is not a single workable Commodore 64 <laughs> left for anybody to play on? I have pondered that same question myself. Um, the good news is they're actually making brand new Commodore 64 motherboards and brand new Commodore 64 cases now. There's actually somebody who got a hold of the original, I uh, forgot what they call it, like the presses or whatever, they use, the molds they use for the plastics. So they're actually reproducing brand new cases from the original molds. But just because they're making the boards, they're not populated with chips. Now, some of those chips are still off-the-shelf chips you can buy today, but some of them are very proprietary and there are no replacements for. And so, yeah, I've wondered the same question. What happens when we run out of Vic video chips? I, I don't know. Um, I mean, we've got the emulators, obviously, so. Yeah. But uh, so many hands raised. Uh, I, so I, I've got a couple of years on you. I started with an Apple II Plus in 1979. I think I was five or six years old or something at that time. And, um, but I had a friend that had a Commodore 64. Commodores were always a little bit mysterious to me until I went to college and won the Amiga 500. But I was always amazed at how much um, more versatile and more colorful and how, how much richer the sound was on the Commodore computer versus the Apples and the PCs at the time. Could you talk a little bit about like, what was I would be happy to talk about that, actually. I've, I wanted to mention this. I've, I've got I've got some Amigas at home too. I, I actually wanted to mention this in one of my episodes, but I I don't really know how to to really fit it in. Um, but believe it or not, so when I was in when I was in junior high, I don't think anybody there had compu had a computer at home. But when I was in high school, there were maybe five kids in the whole school that had computers, and um, most of those uh, were apples. 
And of course, we had apples in the school. I mean, that was like in the computer labs and stuff. Apple II, I think they were mostly two pluses and two E's. I actually hated those machines. I mean, of course, we're talking, you know, I was 14, 15, 16, and I absolutely hated those machines. I hated having to work on them. And, um, um, you know, because I knew what I had at home. And from, what, from, my, from my standpoint at the time, um, my Commodores uh, were vastly superior. And, and so uh, the, the other kids that had apples, we would get into fights all the time, and they would tell me, well, it, it reminds me a lot today of your Apple versus Android type, you know, arguments that you see going on, Apple sucks, you know, Android sucks, no, whatever, you know. And it was the same kind of thing, just like, uh, you know, we have Xbox is great, no, no, PlayStation's great, whatever. It's the same type of, of arguments that we've seen throughout history. And so, you know, they were always telling me my, my Commodore was, was trash and their Apple was better because it had more RAM. And I'd be like, yeah, but my computer has sound and yours just goes bleep, bleep, blop, and whatever. And, um, you know, and he'd actually never even seen my computer, so he didn't really know what it could do. But the funny thing is, is over time, um, I actually have gotten to where I highly respect the old Apple II lines now. And what I didn't realize back in the 80s that I realized today is... And what he just said there was a, a perfect example of that. The Apple II was made years before the Commodore 64 came on the market. Uh, I think it came out in like 77, 78, something like that. So it had like a five year start. Uh, so the Commodore 64 was a much newer machine. So naturally it had more capabilities. And so looking back now, I actually have several Apples now and I much more highly respect the platform because I realized, hey, at the time it came out, there was almost nothing for it to compete with. And it was top of the line when it came out. So, But I didn't know that back then because I didn't have a really good time reference on that kind of thing. So. Uh, Lots of hands raised here. I'll, you in the back there. So I have a friend who is a music enthusiast. He's done the circuit bending on a Game Boy. And I recently bought him one of those uh, Commodore 64s where it's like a little joystick. I think it's the original system on a chip. And do you have any recommendations for where he could go to get started on like making music for it? Because I was pretty impressed with the music quality in that demo. Uh. I don't know. I mean, the, if you're talking about the Commodore DTV, which is the little direct-to-TV joystick that you put the batteries in, yeah, that's what you're talking about. Um, that that one actually does not perfectly emulate the uh, the SID chip in the C64. I don't know if you'd want to use. I mean, you could use that, but it doesn't emulate the SID filters. Which, for your typical games that were made during the ones that it or that it's designed to play, you probably won't notice any difference. But a lot of the demos use uh, much more sophisticated routines. Uh, to make the sound chip do a lot of extra stuff that won't be won't work properly on the 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 little DTV joystick, um, but I mean I don't know I guess for the most part you would treat it just like a C64. I mean you can hook up a disc drive to that and a keyboard and I, I don't know I don't don't really know how to address that. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, who have I been ignoring? How about you? Uh, on the subject of of music, um, are there any like programming tricks that you could like talk about like along the lines of the tricks you're talking about for the graphics like using really fast arpeggios to simulate chords things of that nature um well i'll admit this is not the area I'm most expertise in but uh, uh so he, he's asking me if i can explain some of the tricks they use on the, the sound chip um so actually, I did a video on this where I kind of show some of the tricks. Uh, it's a little bit easier to understand. But um, obviously, one of the things right off the bat I can say is they learned how to do digital sound, where you actually take sound samples and put on there. And uh, the chip was never intended to do that. Um, <laughs> the way they figured out to do it is uh, there's a little trick uh, where when you change the volume register, the, the main volume register on the chip, there's only 16 different levels it can be at. But there's a bug in the chip, and it makes a slight little pop. And uh, normally it's not a big deal. You set the volume, you know, most programmers would set the volume before they would start uh, the music for the game or whatever. And, and so you wouldn't really hear this little pop for the most part. But if you repeatedly set the volume over and over and over again, it'll continue to make that pop. And the, vo and the, the pop actually changes, uh, depending upon what level you set the volume at, is how loud the pop will be heard. And so the, some programmers eventually realize, well, hey, we can actually use this 
to produce digitally sampled audio. Unfortunately, the computers have enough memory to really store, you know, big long samples, but, you know, a few seconds of speech. So it wasn't too long. And this is one of the first tricks they figured out. So I think the first, I think the Ghostbusters game was the first one I ever heard. I think that came out in like 83 or 84, and it, it says, Ghostbusters! And we turn it on. And I remember me and my friends and my brother all, you know, we put that disc in and we heard that and we're like, wow, the computer speaks. We didn't even think that was possible. And again, it wasn't even designed to be able to do that. And of course, later on, some of the later artists, they figured out uh, they can, like he was saying, they can create arpeggios where, um, you know, the machine has three voices, but if you want to have more than that, like if you want to produce a chord, which is usually at least three notes, uh, you can just uh, change the notes really rapidly in succession. And in fact, that's kind of a, a staple of 8-bit or chiptune music these days, is to hear that, that changing pattern in the, in the music as it to our ears kind of simulates uh, the sound of a chord because we're hearing three different notes really quickly in procession, but they're not actually being played at the same time. The other, another big trick they started using was um, simply taking it, keeping all three voices busy all the time. So if, if there's uh, some part of the song that one instrument's being quiet, well that voice isn't being used, so hey, they can stick something else in there and change the voice to a different uh, instrument, even if it's just for one note so they can, they can ring out a little bit more instruments than the three voices would typically provide for. Um, so sometimes you can listen to a Sid song and think you're hearing five or six different instruments, but there's still really only three ever playing at one specific time. That's probably about the limit of what I know on, on, on Sid chips. But they also do some other stuff with the CPU, like they, they modify the, the parameters of the, the pulse waves and stuff. Uh, as the music is playing to make the sounds change a little bit. They have to use the CPU to, to do that, similar to how they do the graphics. They, they keep the numbers changing as the, as the sound is playing. So, uh, next question, I uh, guess you there. Well, at a language level, how do you get to some of those things? Because I remember back in the day, too, everything we were typing in was basic. That's what we learned <laughs> at the very beginning was basic. But we were limited by what the, the numbers and the commands we could use how do you access these tricks? Can you do that in basic? Um, most of these could not be done in basic. It simply doesn't have, uh, it's too slow. And so, yeah, you would have to go to assembly language. And, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how else to really answer that. But, yeah, basic, there's very, very few tricks like that you can do basic. Basic's fun to play with, and it's certainly the first language I ever learned. But uh, it's, you know, you'll find that there's almost no games on the, on the old platforms that are written in basic just simply because they're just not fast enough to, to do any animation. Although, I have written some basic, I don't have any here to show you, but I have written some competition games in basic because uh, every now and then they'll, they'll have these little competitions where they say, let's see what the best game you can write in basic is because again, we know it's extremely limiting and there are some tricks you can do in basic to speed your code up uh, once you learn uh, some, some things to do and so uh, one of the things I wrote a couple of years ago, I don't think I won anything for it, but I did write a working game of Tetris in basic, which that doesn't sound like a lot, but believe it or not, even just moving a piece of a tetramino down the screen is actually very difficult to do in basic and have it move fast enough to actually be enjoyable to play. <laughs> so that was actually quite a challenge for me to write that just because the speed is, is so slow. Next question. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I love in your videos when you take hardware apart. And I was just wondering if you ever get, you, mean, you just look like you know what you're doing. And uh, I just wonder if you ever get in a pickle off camera. Or, you know, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Sometimes I'll even be cussing off camera uh, because I'll wind up with a find a script screw or something like that that I wasn't anticipating. And yeah, I mean, I just turn the camera off and go get the drill or whatever I need to get it, get it undone. And I've had some wires that refused to solder. I had to take the shot like seven or eight times before, you know. And so when I put it all together, it looks makes it look like I'm like, you know, Superman of uh, electronics. But no, it doesn't really work out that way in real life. In fact, one of the things I often remind people when they ask me about my videos, because they're like, why don't you upload more? And I'm like, well, you know, a five minute video usually takes me 20 to 30 hours to produce. Uh, some of my videos are 20 minutes. So yeah, we're looking at 60 hours sometimes to produce one of those videos. And so, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on in the background that, that, that you're not seeing. The editing alone usually takes three or four hours. And, uh, but yeah, there's, hardware doesn't always cooperate. In fact, there's many projects I've started and then not finished because I, I wasn't, you know, I got so far and I'm like, I, I can't make it work. 
screw it, you know, and I'll just start on something else and put that aside. So, yeah, it's not always rosy as I make it look. <laughs> Next question. Do you have any really like intense demos for the Commodore 128 that really showcase that extra 64 k There was one produced. I don't remember the name of it. But, uh, somebody did make one. I watched it a year or two ago, and it even uses the 80 column chip on there uh, fairly impressively. I wish I could remember what it's called, but I'm sorry. But there is at least one out there. I know of. I mean, it's almost virtually not. I know, and that, I actually grew up with the Commodore 128. I think I got it around the time I got into high school, and, and I was always disappointed that there wasn't more software support for it. So, yes, sir. Um, where's good places to find these demos and stuff to, to download? If you just go to Google and type in C64 demo, you will have. In fact, you know what I actually recommend is, and, and believe it or not, I grabbed these off. These are YouTube clips I just grabbed off YouTube. It was quicker to do that than it was to try to record it myself. If you just go to YouTube and type in C64 demo, you'll find tons and tons of them. And they're easy. You don't even have to worry with the emulator. Just play and watch them. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, you're in the back. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. How do I'm sorry, I hear something about human speech. How do you program human speech on the Commodore 64? Well, um, they used that uh, digital trick I was talking about earlier to get uh, the sample sound, and I believe the way they do that is they just simply have samples of all the different like consonants and vowels that the human mouth can make, and they just kind of figure out ways to play those samples in the right order. I, I, I think that's roundabout how it's done. I, I could be wrong. That's not really my area of expertise, but yes, sir. Do you have any uh, compositions that you've made that you'd like to show us? Uh, I don't have anything with me other than the three things I shoved on this laptop right before I left. So, uh, yeah, back, back then. Uh, do you have a progress report on uh, that laptop that died on <laughs> <laughs> No, um, I do have a guy who says he might be able to fix it for me. It's just one of those things I just, I could probably spend another 60 hours on that and not get it working, so I've just, just kind of put that on the back burner. <laughs> what, is it time to stop? Yeah. So, oh. I thought I was supposed to go to 11. No? Uh, 10.45? Oh. Okay. Well, I guess we're done. I think I'm going to be out on a table somewhere where they have like autographs and stuff. If anybody wants to come by, talk to me later. So.